Hello to everyone, and uh, thanks for participating to the new event organized by PMDS. Uh, my name is Steven, and I am uh, one of the members of the association. And before starting with the actual presentation by Christian and Lorenzo, I would like to make a little introduction about what we do and who we are. So what is PMDS? It, it is a polyme association that tries to combine three main aspects. Community, first of all, data science news and events. Indeed, our major goal is to build a community composed by both students and professionals about the data science field. Furthermore, some members of us write blog posts about machine learning tools, techniques or curiosities. And we aim to form groups in order to participate to Kaggle competitions or actons, even if this is, this is still in progress because of the COVID situation. And so we are working on it. And the second goal is about organizing events. In fact, we try to connect our community with professionals or companies whose core business is related to data science or with the researchers that operate in this field. Moreover, uh, we think that just following polytechnical courses about uh, these topics is not enough, and so these events are an opportunity to understand what are the real applications of uh, what we study. So uh, that's it, it's a little introduction. We ask you to join the community to visit our website where you can find all the links to our social networks like uh, Telegram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, or uh, Instagram. And last but not, but not least, uh, we would like to announce that in the next two weeks, we will open the online registrations to become uh, official members of uh, the association. So stay tuned uh, with the news of the association. And uh, so I... That's oh, it, and okay. uh, I would give uh, the floor to Christian. You okay. Can, uh, share your screen. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. And uh, I just want to say that this is a, a really important uh, initiative from you that I we really appreciate what you're doing in the Polytechnic of Milan because we need something like this. And so yes, thank you. And we we will try to support you at the uh, in a more active way from now on. <laughs> Okay, so uh, share my screen. Yes. Okay, yes, just uh, okay. Perfect. Uh, let me just uh, see if I can go in a presentation mode. Is it okay? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Steven, uh, if I may ask, can you unmute yourself? Because I think that some background is also from you. Uh, yes, yes, sorry. I okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, here we are. Let me just check something. Uh, perfect. Okay, uh, so first of all, uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, just to <laughs> listen to me to what I had to say. I hope it will be interesting with the, the insights I will give you about uh, our uh, startup and what we do and uh, also uh, why we're doing this. I'm Christian Schuto. I am uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Daskal together with uh, Lorenzo and Federico. Um, before I start, just a few things about me. I did my bachelor in computer science at Politecnico di Milano. Then I moved uh, in uh, uh, Switzerland, in Lausanne, for my master. And I did my master in computer science focused on uh, data science at the uh, DFDFL. And uh, when I was in Switzerland, I had the, the opportunity to work uh, for uh, Swisscom, is a telco company in, uh, in Switzerland as a data scientist. And I was working on uh, uh, this uh, research area in uh, collaboration with uh, the machine learning and optimization lab of the uh, DFL. And uh, uh, what I wanna say in order to start is that 
when I was there in Switzerland, uh, especially with the, the experience in Swisscom together with uh, my other uh, two colleagues, Lorenzo and Federico, uh, we noticed two things, uh, basically. Uh, first, it's an opportunity, and then a problem that was kind of there, waiting to <laughs> be solved. First thing that we noticed is basically the, the opportunity that I was talking about is that when a, um, an, a company in a traditional industry is actually able to use uh, uh, these new technologies related with data science and exploit their uh, data assets that they have inside the company, something new can be built, something that was not possible before. And uh, this is something that we saw in the past when you have uh, like a new technology, like a common purpose technology uh, that comes in the, uh, in the several industries that kind of disrupts everything that we know until now. But uh, the, the main point of this is that building AI solution for specific industries is a really complicated task. So what we like to say every time is that we uh, notice these three uh, uh, requirements for having like uh, successfully development of uh, a solution related with uh, uh, these new technologies and is uh, the expertise of uh, the data analytics and the artificial intelligence side but also the expertise on the industry domain this is super important in order to translate these technologies in a specific sector and uh, the the last one that I want to highlight is that the, uh, the presence of really a lot of data. This is, of course, we, it's something that for us, it's a super, uh, I mean, uh, important, but uh, I mean, these, for, for other people outside our community and as a data scientist, it's still something that it's uh, uh, not so clear. And the problem that we notice is that in the traditional industries, there is a, an underestimation of the potential of the data that they have. So they, they don't leverage the potential of the assets that they have inside their companies for two main reasons. The first one is the lack of talents, because uh, more than 80% of talents uh, that are uh, uh, that develop these skills on, uh, on these specific uh, topics, they are more attracted by big tech companies instead of working for a traditional company. I mean, we can agree with that uh, <laughs> pretty easily. And the other reason is that, that there is a lack of strategy for these companies. They don't have any specific uh, business strategy behind to adopt AI solution inside their company. So be, from these two things, the opportunity of building new solution and this uh, problem in the traditional industry, we created Daskel. Daskel we want to see as a reality that is uh, like a catalyst to merge this gap between the traditional industries and the data science technologies. In more concrete way, uh, how do we do it? We divided Daskel in two sides, two areas. The first area is the, what we called the hub. That is a, an area where we work on uh, developing tailored AI solutions for specific clients in uh, several uh, markets. And uh, the main goal of this area is to identify common problems and uh, like inside these, uh, these, uh, these markets. And on the same time, identify industry leaders with valuable data in these markets. And why we want this? Because of the second part of Daskel. The second part of Daskel is focused on developing a specific products, it is more product oriented. So when we identify common problems, we want to translate them in a product to uh, introduce uh, uh, in the specific market, in, together with the, the industry leader that we uh, recruited during the, uh, the project that we do in the, in the app side. So the second part of Daskel is focused on the creation of these uh, spin-off partnerships, like new companies, together with these, uh, uh, these industry leaders, uh, in, in order to introduce these vertical products in a specific market. Um, 
from uh, uh, what we said about the hub, let me give you a little bit more information on uh, what we did until now and how we manage data science projects uh, with the specific for uh, on, on uh, the consultancy side. Until now, the area that we explored with the, the app are several. We worked in the fashion industry where we use uh, structured transactional data in order to create targeted marketing solutions for campaigns or recommender system engines. Then we had the pleasure to work with uh, the audio production industry, super cool uh, sector, where we were uh, actually able to access uh, raw audio files and transcripts in order to develop speech-to-text and text-to-speech uh, uh, deep learning solutions. And right now we're working on uh, companies in the manufacturing side where we are uh, building an entire data-driven strategy assessment on several uh, business units that they have inside the company and we have full access to their data. And also uh, with companies related more on the IoT side, uh, where we can uh, leverage data like images, time series sensor signals for uh, companies in uh, agriculture or more related with solution on, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, dynamic payload estimation uh, uh, directly from the, the, the signals of the sensors. So this is just to have a broad uh, view of uh, how intersectoral is our approach on the, on the hub side. But another thing that I want to underline is uh, something that most of the time maybe we don't talk that much, is that there is, uh, no, there is something that is common to every data science project, no matter what domain or, or like which data you're using, and is actually the risk of failure. It's always, I mean, we always saw this pattern every time. So what happens? It happens that there are these common mistakes. So first of all, we need to uh, recognize that doing a data science project most of the time is uh, research and development. What does it mean? It means that mo it can happen that uh, if you're not able to identify a specific business case, you're, you're already uh, doing one of the first most biggest mistake that you can do. The second thing that uh, uh, it's um, commonly uh, to do a like, mistake is uh, don't do an assessment of your data. Like, when there is a, a lack of data quality assessment, you don't know actually the data that you can use to leverage for a specific solution. And the last one is that most of the time when we, when we like there is a development of a data science project, uh, there is uh, no focus on uh, building an infrastructure for the evaluation of the solution. Not only from the technical side, like the, all the metrics that we are used to use for classification or regression, computational resources. These are, okay, these are super important on the technical aspect. But most of the time, uh, what, la what, what we lack is that we don't do like... Uh, an evaluation of the uh, business metrics. So there are like companies, they start to do data science projects and they don't use any metrics to measure how, what is the impact of the solution on the, on the specific business case. So all of these mistakes, they can translate in what for our client, in risks. So the client can risk to have a long-term commitment on a project and that this is something that the client doesn't want most of the time. And also for this, there is a high, uh, high investments that are required. And because uh, most of the time uh, they don't evaluate the, the business impact of the solution, there's also no possible prediction of the return of investment of this solution. So these are, this is an overview of uh, uh, how a data science project can actually fail. So what do we do in Daskell in the hub to uh, minimize this risk that we just saw? We follow this uh, simple uh, 
project strategy that we like uh, to summarize in uh, this word that I put here, like think big, start small, escape fast. So we follow these four specific steps where first of all, think big, business alignment with the client. What do we do in this part is identify specific business problems. Start always from the problems of the clients, listen to the problem of the client. Once we identify these business problems, we need to identify the data sources available for the, uh, for, from the client in order to understand what we need to collect more, if we want to collect more data, uh, what, uh, what we can use already from now. And uh, at the end of this business item, what we have is a, a, validation, of, is a validation of initiatives that we can develop together with the client. So after this, we start small in order to avoid a long commitment for the client and a high investment for the client. With what? With a proof of concept. So in the proof of concept stage, what we do is we develop a prototype for the client. And if it's needed, we also develop like a, an infrastructure to uh, collect new data, to, like a data management infrastructure in order to uh, uh, develop the solution of uh, the prototype that we want. And in this phase, in, because it's a, a, pretty, a relative fast uh, phase, what we can do, we can validate the, the prototype and also validate the return of investment for the client. And then it is followed, of course, by a validation and the monitoring of the solution with A-B testing, monitoring the technical metrics that we were discussing before, for example, about the prototype itself, like more technical, the, the, the usual metrics that we all know and that they teach us uh, at the university. But most importantly is uh, uh, the monitoring of business KPIs. So see these metrics and see uh, how the solution is uh, uh, having an impact on the business case. This is super important because you can show to the clients uh, what, uh, what is the potential of introducing a solution like this inside the company. And after these three steps, if the client is satisfied with the solution, there is the industrialization part, where we scale to the full organization and we uh, develop a long-term strategy for the clients and how to uh, rearrange like uh, the process management inside the company also for their resources that they have to use these new tools because it's not only about technology it's uh, most of the time is about uh, people that they uh, need to uh, accept the change inside the company and uh, learn to use these new tools so it's a, a, a mixture of these two things. So with this, we had an overview of what we do in the, in the hub for the development of these uh, uh, custom projects. And in this, uh, this last part, I focus more on the second area of Daskal that is focused on developing specific products. So uh, how do we go from uh, a custom project to building a partnership for developing a specific products. The process is, can be summarized in these first steps. Uh, first of all, of course, there is a, the main part is uh, from the hub where we have these projects to identify this common problem in a specific market. Once we identify a problem that is uh, um, scalable, that is something that we see that um, most of the, uh, the realities in that market have, we look for uh, a partner for, uh, this, uh, for the spin-off. And in this part of the recruitment, it can be a previous client, maybe a client that we worked uh, for the, the custom project, okay? Or it can be a sector leader with high quality data asset. So we introduce to, to, the, to, the, to the company, we try to understand if there, is a, there can be a collaboration between us. And then there is the, the third step, there is the partnership agreements. There is also another important uh, part where basically we understand how we uh, can create uh, 
a new reality, a new startup focused on uh, this specific product. And until now, we follow two approaches. The first approach is uh, uh, having an agreement about uh, the equity shares of the new company that can be basically said like we split the company in two parts. This is owned by Dasker, this is owned by the, uh, the partner. This is a high level, it's pretty easy to understand. Or there's another approach a little bit more sophisticated where you basically have royalties like uh, a percentage on the, the usage of uh, the license that you're developing for the partner. So these are um, two main uh, approach to uh, making uh, happen the, the the partnership with the uh, with the with the other with the other company. And the end of this, there is a the the creation of the spin off. So in this part, uh, uh, Dusk is like bootstrapping the entire thing on the technology side, because we are responsible for the technology development, the core technology development. So basically, uh, a team from Daskel uh, is uh, responsible to start the development of this technology. And also in the, main in, the, in the same time, what we are responsible of is to recruit technical positions in order to build a strong team to, let's say, let the spin off walk by himself, okay? And uh, the last part is also, uh, I mean, to not forget, it, is that we are responsible also for fundraising. So because we have a, an investor uh, network of investors that uh, rely on us because uh, our approach is to build these new realities. So we approach the investors and we present the, the new company. So what happened until now on the spin-off area, uh, we started, uh, Daskell started in May 2019. Sorry if I didn't say it. So in one year, what we did is that we started our first spin-off in uh, the beginning of February. It's called Voiced, and it's about uh, voice synthesis. And uh, uh, you will see more <laughs> in the second part. It's the first spin-off in the audio production field uh, in collaboration with the industry expert and a multinational company on that field. We were validating uh, um, pro, uh, a spin-off uh, on the um, precision agriculture that unfortunately was postponed by COVID. Uh, okay, it happens. Uh, we'll, we'll see uh, when we can start again. But this uh, spin-off was about uh, uh, basically creating an autonomous robot that goes to the field and can recognize automatically uh, detecting uh, weeds and plants, see the quality of the plants. Uh, uh, it was a really cool project uh, related with computer vision. And now we are exploring uh, some solutions related with the, the retail market and also for marketing solution, more about uh, how we can leverage transactional data for hyper-personalization solution. So this is, was uh, an overview of what happened until now related with the, the spin-off, but uh, you will have more details in the second part by Lorenzo with a running example from uh, Voice. So just to recap for, uh, before we conclude for this first part, what we saw, we basically had a first introduction about Dask, about the idea behind the opportunity and the problems that we wanted to solve. First, it's good the idea, but the, the most important part is being able to identify the, the problems that you want to tackle. The second part was about the, the hub, the Daskal approach for uh, looking for possible uh, uh, developments of a, a new product and how we handle uh, the projects with the, the risk that we can uh, have and uh, how we try to minimize this risk with the, the pipeline that we saw. And finally, uh, a focus on the spin-off, so the process from the custom projects to a product opportunity. So in the second part, what we will see is more like a spin-off hands-on. So we will have our running example of Voiced, where we will have an introduction about uh, how it happened, how we created this uh, uh, this uh, this spin-off, 
then a focus on uh, like the development of a minimum viable product. What does it mean? Okay, this is uh, another super interesting aspect. And then, uh, I mean, the, the last, the, the cherry on the pie is more something for us engineers, okay? More like a technical ex explanation of uh, the solution that we are developing with us at the end, uh, a demo uh, by Lorenzo. So, uh, okay, for this, I think I did a good recap of uh, uh, my, uh, what I want to, what I want to, uh, tell you from uh, from my side and uh, if you have the, any any questions uh, right now that we will have uh, the small break just write in the chat and uh, let me know uh, I mean I'm, I'm here for, <laughs> for for anything that you want to ask so thank you very much and uh, so if uh, maybe Steven or someone else want to come back uh, for the first part we can uh, we can conclude here Yes, I'm here, so uh, you can open the chat for reading okay. the questions. Coming back because, okay, here I will stop the, where are you? So, okay. Okay. Stop sharing. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, okay. Um, okay. Why did you decide that? Okay, we'll start with the first one. Why did you decide to come back to Italy to create Dask? This is a good question. It's like, uh, are you crazy? Why did you come back? <laughs> uh, okay, uh, personally, I have uh, two, two things that I wanted to say. The first one was more related on, on the business side is that we noticed that uh, in, in Italy, there was like a blue ocean situation a little bit because uh, uh, the competition on this field, it's, uh, pretty uh, pretty little, okay? So there was a really good opportunity to um, position our startup and our uh, idea, Daskel, as a, like a, a leader in, the, in Italy for a data science uh, solution approach uh, related with consultants, but also in developing these new products. And in the same idea, maybe uh, developed in uh, in Switzerland, it could have been uh, already um, a, a set, uh, like a different approach because uh, already in Switzerland there are other uh, realities like ours that so that from from like a com com competitive side, it's so it was already different. And uh, also, you need to consider about the cultural side. So there were. Uh, the, the most important thing is that the time was uh, was was uh, really uh, positive in Italy because uh, right now in Italy big companies are becoming more and more aware about uh, the potential of these new technologies, but still there is no uh, um, unique uh, like a specific company that you look for and you see okay for this thing I I go to 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 this company to, to develop something related with AI or uh, data science solution. So this is more related on the business side. On more like personal side is because I didn't want to escape, you know? Because uh, I developed this, we developed these skills uh, as engineers, as uh, uh, young people. We, we know that we can do our work uh, in a good way and we wanted to do in our country. I mean, we wanted to show that uh, also in Italy, you can do cool stuff and you don't have to go abroad for uh, finding a company to do what you studied for. Because uh, like, uh, already, like right now in Italy, it's difficult to find maybe some position for like deep learning thing or other stuff. So we said, okay, let, let's do it by ourselves. Let's, let's give the opportunity also to other Italian people to uh, show that uh, they can 
develop uh, and they can work on this field in Italy. So th that was also uh, the, my personal uh, side uh, for, for the answer. Uh, okay, then Tommaso, hi Tommaso, thank you for that. How many are you working in now in Daskel? In Daskel we are uh, four people operative, then there is a group of the investor behind uh, with uh, uh, more on the management side. And uh, for the first spin-off invoices, there are uh, operative uh, other uh, three people and uh, uh, on, the, on the management side, other two people. And then, uh, okay, sorry if I pronounce bad, Pragati Gupta. On average, how many people work on one project and what tools are being used on Dusk currently? Uh, good, uh, good question. On average, for like a proof of concept, uh, like two people, one or two people, not, not more than uh, that two people. And uh, for, uh, for the tools that we use, it depends on the project itself. But uh, let's say that we stay really low level, like we build everything from scratch. So we use uh, for prototyping, we use Python. If it's uh, uh, more related with the deep learning approach, we work a lot uh, with the PyTorch as a framework to develop uh, these, uh, the, the prototyping models. When we have to deploy, it depends or on the, the client's needs. Because for example, for the um, IoT, maybe you have to do everything in, in real time there, not in the cloud. So you need uh, to, to, have, uh, to, to think about constraints, about the, so the, the comput computational solution. So maybe we work with the C++ or C, uh, also for the deployment uh, with uh, AWS uh, and uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for this maybe Lorenzo will give you a little bit more of, uh, of the information in the second part. Vavasori uh, Luca. Ciao Christian, I'm going to bring this idea into reality. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you Luca. We, we can have a talk <laughs> later maybe, uh, three broad questions. About business alignment, how much of this part is done before coming to a project agreement with the client and how often you encounter major problem after the start? Uh, uh, first of all, how, how much part is done before coming to a project agreement? Actually, um, uh, pretty nothing. I mean, we have the agreement and then we do a project, uh, project alignment, the real project alignment uh, to define the, the uh, I mean, there, there is already a contract built. Of course, there is a first quick project alignment, but then we dedicate like full two weeks, two to four weeks uh, to work uh, uh, in parallel with the client on this first part. That is uh, super important. Uh, I encounter a major problem after the start of a project. Poor, uh, okay, the poor data quality and lack of domain knowledge. Uh, for the data quality, is something that we stressed from the beginning. We really want to see the data that they have because uh, we, before we can have like a, the list of use case initiatives that we want to develop with the client, we can see which data we can use. I mean, most of the time the clients, they want to go to the moon, okay? But they want to go to the moon with a bike, okay? <laughs> so this is most of the time the poor data quality that we see. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's fine, okay? But so the, our, our first uh, duty is to let them understand the quality of their data and maybe uh, let them know that the first step is actually enrich the data that they have to have a more valuable asset to, to use. Uh, how many partners do you usually get in contact uh, with the create a spin-off? And usual agreement on the usual agreements that we saw that uh, that uh, you're asking we saw uh, we followed these two 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 approaches more on the um, uh, like uh, equity uh, agreements and the other one is uh, on uh, percentages of licensed royalties that we have and how do you raise funds uh, for raising funds we have uh, uh, like an, our network of investors that uh, it's a group of uh, uh, 
people in several industries inside this group of investors. So we start from then and then we have a, a specific strategy uh, for the, the fundraising for, for, for this. And okay, and Nicola, uh, hi Nicola. Uh, uh, please guys stop me if it's uh, too much. Uh, I will try to go quick uh, as possible, sorry. Uh, congratulations, how did you find out your customer need? Oh, so uh, this is also a nice question. Uh, it's uh, uh, everything related with the business alignment part. The first part, what we do is basically um, what happens, it can happen that a client contact us because sometimes they are just curious, sometimes they have already a business problem, and sometimes they uh, they feel they have good, like a good amount of data and they want to see what they can do with this data. So after a first broad alignment to understand if there can be a collaboration and starting with, a, with, a, with a, a, a project, after this, the first part that I was telling you on the business alignment that, that most of the time takes from two to four weeks is just to talk with the client but not only uh, with uh, the, the technical group, uh, like the IT or, uh, okay. But most of the time with the executives, we need to talk with the executives because uh, from the executives you have, you can tell them uh, like uh, the broad approach from the uh, strategy side and they can then can act uh, on, on the several, uh, the several group that are, uh, under their responsibilities. And the other thing that we do is we talk with the, uh, the people that use the data, okay? For example, uh, uh, sorry. Um, like the, the people that use uh, the specific data and see how they use it, they use it uh, daily. So they can uh, basically, we, we can have a broad information of uh, how they, uh, they they make use of uh, out of it, and then we found out the the bottlenecks and the needs that they have. Um, I got you. Consider the Blue Ocean Internet. How are you planning to protect uh, uh, your uh, boundaries? This is uh, actually a really uh, cool questions. Is to uh, diversify. We we want to. The, the approach that we are that we are uh, that we follow right now with our business model, so having like a consultant uh, business model uh, in parallel with a more like a product development business model, is to diversify a portfolio offer. So we will always do our consultancy, but it will be more and more uh, like a tool for the real thing that is building this uh, this uh, this solution on the on the traditional industries. And with diversification of solution, you can kind of protect what you're doing. Another thing is that uh, on, the, on protecting, like uh, the, the, the spin-off that, that you are creating is more about technological side and also the data that you have. I mean, you will see maybe with voice it is what I'm trying to say, but uh, data and technological uh, barriers are super important. Alessandro, what type of programming application is used for the application? Uh, mostly Python, as I said, for prototyping, and then it depends on uh, the computational requirements on uh, the deployment. Okay, Ana Pina, thanks for the presentation. Clients being open to start up like your company. What usually are the challenges that you face when being able to get the project? And this is a nice question. It's always about uh, the practical uh, the practical uh, uh, proposal that we do most of the time uh, they uh, we we kind of uh, get the client on board because our uh, proposal are super concrete from the beginning to the end and uh, it's uh, and also with uh, the, the traction that we are doing right now uh now what is it it's long to skip okay thank you uh Michele. Have there been any difficult times so far? What are the tips for a person who wants to start a startup? Uh, this, is a, this is a nice, uh, nice question. Uh, thank you, Michele. For, for your question, what uh, I would say is that 
uh, I want to stress out every time and it, it's not just about the idea and you can see also from the way we structure a Duskel to develop uh, products it's not just about the idea but it's about the market the way you want to position the, the startup in that specific market the client's needs and how to translate the cool idea in something that it's not just cool but something that people want to use because they 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 need to use it you know so it's about timing and it's about domain expertise on a specific uh, field that's why uh, we really want to partner up with uh, people on a specific industries because they know the market most of the time they also have a pool of possible clients they have already connection network with this so it's not only about the idea but also considering the full aspect of this uh filippo fedeli are you a startup innovativa yes we are a startup innovativa did you go through an accelerator incubator no we didn't do that and uh, uh, we didn't feel the need of uh, going through an accelerator for the, for the spin-off uh, uh, Voiced, uh, there is a talk about an accelerator and um, Lorenzo will tell you a little bit more. But for Daskel, uh, we did everything by ourselves. Okay. Let's, okay, I, I think that it's time for the second part, maybe. Okay. Sure. So, thank okay. you, Christian. Thank you, Christian, for answering all the questions. <laughs> Sorry, I took so much time. No, 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 no. So uh, now, Lorenzo, can you... Uh... Okay, hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Continue. Oh, desktop one. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes, yes. You can see okay. it and uh, I mute myself. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you for the opportunity of presenting both Daskel and uh, Voice today. And thank you, Christian, for the beautiful presentation of our beautiful reality. <laughs> so I'm, I'm here to talk about Voice it, um, which core objective is to create artificial emotional uh, voices. Uh, first of all, a couple of words about myself. I have a very similar background to Christian ones. I did my bachelor in computer science at uh, Politecnico di Milano and my master in, uh, in computer science at the PFL. Uh, then I had uh, some experience uh, as a researcher at the lab at the PFL, directed by Robert West. And then I worked as an intern, uh, a data scientist uh, uh, intern in, uh, in Swisscom working uh, mostly on emotion recognition and uh, audio emotional generation. So this is it about me. And now let's start with Voicing. Uh, I would like to explain you guys about Voicing from our point of view as we lived it. And at the same time, it really mirrors uh, the business model, Duskel business models. So uh, we first uh, met a multinational company, which core business is localization for video games. That means uh, actually translating and dubbing from the source language. So for example, English in foreign languages, uh, the video game audio. And a very common problem during this process is uh, quality control. And uh, that means checking audio and text pairs audio recorded by a voice actor and text that is the, the actual script that the voice actor should say, checking them and see if the content of the audio respect the content of the text. And if there are mistakes, um, the voice actor is uh, called back to the studio to record again. This manual check is very, very expensive and time consuming since they have to control thousands of hours each year. So um, that was their problem then they wanted to automate at least part of this uh, quality control. But unfortunately, speech to text solutions uh, in order to transcribe the content of the audio and match it with the, with the, with the text 
uh, they do not work with uh, video games data. That's because they are really, really expressive. And the, generally the actors and the characters have very strong accents and third party speech to text are not used to see this kind of audio files. So they have a very high word error rate. So we understood with them their problem and our solution was based on the implementation of a speech to text that was trained on their data uh, so that the, the model uh, already knew what was the, um, what was the kind of accent. Uh, it already knew what to expect. Working on this problem, we had the chance to discover what kind of data and it's, it un um, unlocked value uh, the, um, the company was, uh, was owing at the time. They had thousands of hours of multilingual audio uh, with thousands of speakers uh, with transcript uh, for each audio file. And this is a very unique data set because almost nobody uh, have access to such data, not even the big ones, not Google or Facebook or Amazon, because it's a very industry specific, um, uh, industry specific data. So when we saw that, uh, we understood that we could do something more than just speech to text and move forward to text to speech solution. Uh, we also had the possibility to uh, meet other people uh, while uh, uh, evaluating this, uh, this project, this text-to-speech project, and we met what we call the industry leader or the industry expert. And this for us was a very, very important figure because uh, it's very good if you know how to develop the tech, but the main thing that you want is not to go to your customers with something that they think, oh, wow, this is super cool, but with something that when they see it, they say, oh, I want to use it. And the difference is whether you do a product knowing what are the needs of that industry. And that's what the industry leader or industry expert um, or is doing uh, for us right now in, uh, in Boise. So we, we evaluated the project. Everyone liked it very much because it's super cool. So we created a new spin-off that is Boise. Boise, as I was saying, and as Christian already presented, uh, is composed by three main pillars. Uh, the first one is the, technolo the technological partners, that is Dusker, that is us that is making the bootstrap on the technical part. Uh, then uh, another partner of Voice is the industry expert that uh, he had more than 25 years experience in the audio production fields. He has a lot of connections with the markets and uh, he knows very deeply what are the needs in the market and how to shape the product and the technology that we are developing. Moreover, he has been seed investor of this uh, new reality. Moreover, there is the multinational company that is uh, currently becoming uh, our commercial partner. Uh, and it's very important because they are giving us the data, the data we need uh, to, to make the best possible outcome uh, from uh, our, uh, our algorithms. A uh, couple of facts. Uh, we had a seed investment of around 250,000 uh, euros. And we have been accepted as Voices uh, to an acceleration program in uh, Silicon Valley um, at uh, Berkeley Skydeck. Unfortunately, the program was postponed due to coronavirus. But we will go there probably in uh, October 2020. And uh, we are going there also thanks to Duskel and Voices partnership with MIND, uh, that is the Milan Innovation District. Um, that they are building in the Art Expo. So Voiceid was born to actually solve very specific problems. In general, we have that in the audio industry, uh, the, there are high costs for voice actors and current text-to-speech solutions sound really robotic and still we need physical places such as studios to record our voices. 
In particular, in the video game sector, we have for each game a lot of characters, and a lot of characters imply a lot of voices. And the consequence of this problem is that the costs are too high to dub the games in all the published languages. So we will have the video game translated in few languages, the major languages, and all the other languages will have most probably subtitles. Uh, there is another, uh, another sector like audiobooks, uh, where we, another problem is the effort uh, required to prepare the, the narrator. And as a consequence, we have that for one book, uh, we cannot choose between narrators, but we only have one. And each character inside the book has the same voice as the narrator generally. And as a last example, we, um, we found problems uh, uh, concerning voice also in the customer care sector, since there are high costs for employees. And when they use artificial voices, they do not sound natural uh, adding as a consequence a uh, problem on, on the customer experience uh, of their clients. So what do we need to uh, address this problem I just described? We firstly need high quality emotional data sets. Uh, we need someone that knows uh, what are the problems and how to shape the product in order to solve them. And of course, we need the core technology uh, behind the, the product. So technical expertise to develop speech to text and text to speech modules. In order to solve these kind of problems, uh, we, uh, I'll show you here like high level, what are the customer needs? And we can divide them in three parts. We have scripted content. That means uh, I have a script. So I already know what my characters will say and i need a software a product a platform that uh, will uh, make voices and audio from this text and these uh, these needs touches different verticals such as video games entertainment audiobooks and e-learning and um, uh, it will be a platform integrated in the audio production pipeline then we have other two needs unscripted contents where we don't know uh, as a prior what we will say such as newspaper reading and chatbots and it will be a cloud service solution uh, through API calls and as a last example uh, embed the solutions so like giving Alexa uh, the voice of voices or multiple voices or give our car uh, a custom voice so in order to solve these problems and create this operating model that actually works, it's important to think big and to understand what's the shape of the final product. Uh, this is really important in order to give you a goal where you want to arrive. And we did that. We uh, outlined all the features that our product uh, should have had. And so, for example, we know that our product should have prosody control. So we need to be able to control the emotion and the emission and the speed, for example, of the audio that we output from our model. We also need to give our customers uh, the possibility to custom their voice, to select their characters or to clone voices that are of interest. They need to have control over time and words. So, for example, select a, a certain style for a word or for a certain segment of time. Another requirement that we know that is really important is that a line uh, should um, generally have time constraints. So we need to have uh, a duration control uh, in, our, um, in our product. And then, for example, pronunciation controls. So uh, being able to manage in a smart way poses or add efforts or ethics to the voice uh, when saying particular particular things. So it's good to think big, but as Christian already explained, it's very important to start small. And why starting small? Because if we are going from day zero, uh, if you want to go from day zero to the moon, we will probably fail because it's really important to understand what our customer wants and thanks to an iterative feedback uh, pipeline, we are able to improve our product um, with each step uh, of development. So in our case, 
uh, we are working on a pipeline of MVPs, that means minimum viable products, that are not uh, uh, the final product. They are, of course, lacking of a lot of features, but they are still usable uh, from our customer. And they're not made to get some money out of them, but to get feedbacks. And that's really important because the most important thing is to correct uh, what you did wrong as soon as possible, instead of arriving at the end of your journey where you have a lot of errors and it's very difficult to come back from there. So in our first iteration, our first MVP, uh, we'll have just 10 voices. We'll be able to clone style from one audio to the other and we'll be able to move in the pod space, that means the, the emotional space. In the second iteration, we will add other features such the voice space uh, definition, that means creating voices. We will give prosody control and emotional transfer, and so on and so on, until we will arrive to the last iteration of our product that will have the shape of the product. So it will be our product version 1.0, uh, where our customer will have the possibility to create characters. These characters will not only have a voice that will define them, but also a textures of styles that will define their personality uh, when speaking. And also natural pitch variation, that is something very important if you don't want your voice to sound artificial and, and not human. <clears throat> so it's all very good and very ambitious, but I think the biggest question here is how, how do you do it? So generally, text-to-speech models are uh, made, as you can see from, uh, from this slide. Uh, they are given an input text. This input text is encoded, uh, compressed in some sort of Latin space, and this Latin space is then decoded uh, into audio wave or first a spectrogram and then an audio wave again. And these models, they actually work pretty good, but they have, uh, they have a problem. They, they, con they do not control uh, the expressivity of the, um, of the output audio. And so we decided to solve it, uh, giving uh, to our model an input audio as an input as well. This input audio is compressed to an embedding that we call a style embedding. And this is um, another input for our model that is concatenated to the encoder of the acoustic model. And then uh, the encoded representation of the text and the encoded representation of the audio are decoded in the audio wave. This uh, style extraction is done in an unsupervised way, but since the model already sees what the content of the audio uh, from the text, uh, what remains to extract from the input audio is all the remaining parts, so the style, the prosody of that audio. And why during training we need an input audio uh, to extract the style from? Uh, during inference, we don't need the audio, but we can already create the style embedding. So if we know the style space, we can sample uh, one element from that space and give it to our model. And this is just one part because uh, we can do this in an unsupervised way as we are doing it. We don't have any style label, any prosodic label. We are just compressing that audio and trying to reproduce it uh, given, the, given the input text. But we can also have supervised tasks that create uh, um, an own space for our model. So for example, if we have uh, uh, emotional labels over our audios, we can create a speech emotion classifiers and, having, and we can have a Latin representation of the emotion and then we give this Latin representation of the emotion to our acoustic model that is then conditioned to the emotion and to the text or to the emotion, to the text and the style embedding. And we can do the exact same thing with all the other parameters that we like to control, for example, voices. So uh, we can have a speaker recognition classifier where we encode the audio 
uh, trying to extract meaningful, meaningful features for the voice space and giving these features as another conditioning input to our acoustic model. So, as I said, <clears throat> we can condition over several space. Uh, we can condition over the voice space, uh, the emotional space, the emission space, the product space. And here I have um, a few examples of a single speaker model that has been conditioned on the prosody space. So I'm not sure if you can hear it. Tell me if you cannot hear it. I will start with the normal one. Uh, that is the mean embedding from the style space. At Voisey, we generate realistic voices to be used in every situation. Um, yes. Can, yes. You, yes. you can hear it. Yes. Great. So this, uh, this audio file uh, was made from our model that was conditioned uh, with a vector that was the actual mean of all the styles. So, so we have a very normal voice speaking. But if we move in the style space towards a lower pitch, this happens. At Voisey, we generate realistic voices to be used in every situation. Or if we move in the emission space and we say whisper, this happens. At Voisey, we generate realistic voices to be used in every situation. Or if we move in the emotional space and we say be more excited, this happens. At Voisey, we generate realistic voices to be used in every situation. And this is very good because we can control the audio file without having any reference, but just moving around the prosodic space. Another important thing that is really important is to control the styles uh, through time. And if you're working in dubbing, that's a requirement. So here there is another example where we moved in the prosodic space uh, throughout the, the sentence. At Voisey, we generate thinking about the future emotional voices because we like to think that ultra-realistic voices are the future for civil services, not only dubbing, but also the audiobook sector as well as call centers. So we went from normal people to crazy <laughs> screaming girl. Okay, jokes aside, we went from whisper calm to high pitch desperate in the prosodic um, style space. So that was it for the first part of the presentation. Now I will give you a live demo. That's the only thing you shouldn't do during the presentation because generally demos work when you are all by yourself and when you show them to other people, they generally don't work, but let's hope that this is not the case. So here I will go to my notebook. Okay, can you, can you see the notebook guys or you're still on the presentation? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, great. See. Okay, great. So here we have a completely different model. Uh, we have a female Italian single speaker, and we had a training data set of around 10 hours with four different emotions, angry, happy, neutral, and sad. And we trained our model to extract meaningful features to recreate the emotional audio. So uh, I will give you an example of what does that mean. So let's start with the sad emotion. Uh, the sentence is, la mia squadra preferita è stata sconfitta, ma nessuno se lo aspettava. La mia squadra preferita è stata sconfitta, ma nessuno se lo aspettava. And this is an example of sad, so we are sampling from uh, the emotional space going to the, uh, from the sad distribution and giving this vector as a second input um, over the text. And then we can change it. We can move to happy, for example, and give it the happy emotion to our model. Fuori c'è il sole e non vedo l'ora di andare a fare una passeggiata al parco. <laughs> we can see that she's really happy going outside, especially after COVID, I suppose. And then last emotion is the angry one. And let's see what happens. Oggi sono veramente arrabbiata, non ce la faccio più a cambiare emozione di continuo. Okay, so we saw that she was 
angry enough. And this model is actually very robust uh, on the text representation. So, for example, we can even play with it and make it speak a completely different language and giving the reversed sentence. And still maintaining the emotion, of course. Buoni tocchi de noi somerai bacao i tuoi cafaletti non la tai barra e ne marevono sì. Ok. Ok, now that's, that's it for me guys. Uh, no, wait, wait, uh, wait, wait, Lore, wait. Lore. Try to write, uh, try to write uh, uh, what? a sentence uh, in uh, like English but uh, in Italian English. Ok, now you're gonna break my demo. I was <laughs> The, 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 the English. <laughs> okay. Of course, since it's trained on the Italian language, we have to create our English. So the demo is very beautiful <laughs> and we like it very much i don't know how to say much 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 no 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 three c's no i don't, I don't <laughs> two c's it. it will be probably very much but let's no, not just just write the very angry angry, angry. Like. We, we we want the angry 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 one i oh, no, wait uh In english deck. english english deck. <laughs> the demo is very beautiful and do you like it very much <laughs> very much <laughs> <laughs> say it, say it, happy. Happy, 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 happy. The demo is very beautiful and do you like it very much? <laughs> <laughs> I agree with her. I completely agree with her. Very much. Okay, okay. So that's that's it. That's it, guys. Uh, guys, uh, that was really improvised. That, that was uh, a bit that, that we <laughs> decided to do. <laughs> ah, voce triste, contesto. Okay, sad voice with text. No. Okay, tell me what, what did you ask again? Okay, said text with happy. Let's try. It really seems that she's joking when you do this thing. Consento. You cannot hear it? No. No. How not? Uh, Maybe it's the, the microphone, you know. Uh, wait. Or maybe we broke the demo, yes. We broke the demo, we did it. <laughs> um, I mean, let's, let's try again. No, it's, uh, I think it's, um, I think because I can hear it pretty low, I think there's something ah. wrong with the, with the Zoom, I don't know. Mm, I really don't know what to do. Uh, okay. let's okay that's okay, that's okay. Um, let me try to stop the sharing and do it again share okay okay here we do something that you will ask what's this and then just changing the intensity of the emotion so let's try again Tell me if you can hear it kind of okay. La mia squadra preferita è stata sconfitta, ma nessuno se lo aspettava. Does it work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's Let enough. me open the chat if there are... That's enough. Okay, okay so guys, uh, we that's all for the second part. If you have uh, any questions, be I mean, write uh, write uh, whatever you want, we are here for you. Yeah, and another thing, guys, if you are curious of going deeper about what we're doing, uh, just come to the office and we can talk with you guys and see and let and show you even more things. And by the way, we are also recruiting, so if someone is even interested in going that direction, I, we are I, doing I, that. Yeah. Okay, so. Question, guys. Ah, yeah, here in the chat. It's funny to read the chat. Thank you, guys, to to have uh, fun with us. <laughs> uh, okay, we start from the end. 
what kind of embedding do you use for the text part? Uh, we actually learn the embedding through the, through the training of the model. Uh, we just have an embedding layer as a first part of our model, and then that embedding is just goes through all over the model encoder, decoder, concatenation with all the other embeddings. And so it, it's, it's just learned uh, while training. So, super cool. Did you already implement a sentiment analysis like thing where it understands the sentence and chooses the right emotion? No, we didn't do that, but it's actually something uh, very cool and something that we are thinking uh, of doing, especially for um, the call center size side of our business, uh, since it's really important to understand uh, what's the emotion that you are receiving and under and answer with the with the right tone. From Pagati Gupta. First of all, it was an amazing demonstration. I have a small question: pitch, frequency, acousticness, energy, etc can be computed, but how are you converting emotions into a feature of the model? Okay. Um, Maybe go back pitch, to the... Uh, wait, wait, pitch, frequency, acoustic, acousticness, energy can be computed, yes. 80% uh, yes, I would say, because still when you use um, rule-based algorithm, let's call it like that, you're still missing um, some shadows of the pitch and of the energy. Um, so there are some models that work with pre-computed features like those ones, uh, but still they have been demonstrated not to work as well as um, uh, learning this representation directly from the generation process. So uh, answering to your second part, so, uh, uh, how are you converting emotions into a feature of the model? Here there are two possibilities. Or you do something like an emotion classifier and you cut that classifier at one of the top layers of the model and you take the latent representation of the emotion and you use that latent representation as a conditioning input um, of, the, of the acoustic model or you learn that representation directly during the generation process. So uh, you have an audio as an input, you compress it with an encoder with some convolution or recurrent neural networks. And so you have a compressed representation of the audio. And if the data set you have is a very emotional data set, uh, very much probably the features uh, that you have in your compressed representation uh, will, uh, um, will uh, mean the, the, the emotion representation. Tommaso Cinelli, and where is your office? Via Francesco Soave 24, Fede replies, great. <laughs> Anna, do you have any mentoring initiative for those who want to better the skills in data science by helping out in projects? I mean, uh, uh, it, we can do something for sure. Uh, but for example, already the, the stage that we, we put out is also... Something. Yeah, we, are, we have stage both in, in Daskers or Voices for someone who wants to try uh, if this is uh, their, their path. At the same time, they have to be super motivated because we like motivated people. Okay. But yes. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, from Luca, what model is at the base of it? Custom made or something in the, like WaveNet or Deep Voice? Uh, okay, WaveNet, uh, Deep Voice, uh, they are uh, vocoders, so they, well, it, it depends. WaveNet can also be, can also take as an input text, but is generally used as a vocoder. That means that takes as an input some audio features. So for example, spectrograms and uh, translate spectrograms to the audio wave. Uh, so uh, where the spectrogram comes from, the spectrogram comes from acoustic model. In our case, we are using the, the Tarkotron model that actually translate uh, text into spectrograms. And then we have something like WaveNet. We are not using WaveNet. We are using 
uh, Wavegrow or Melgan, that are two others, two other vocoders, to transform our spectrogram into uh, audio wave. Are you using your own servers, AWS or the client one? Uh, the client one, we don't have a client right now, even if it would be super cool to have one, but we have a very nice partner. So we are using our own server. We have a super cool server, 10 GPUs, and so many CPUs that I don't even remember how many they are. But yes, we are using our own servers. Um, ten, what, uh, 10 GPUs, uh, 10 RTX, uh, 20 APTI. GTI, yeah, and 72 cores, I think. Like and that, and yeah. out, uh, out a terabyte of RAM. I mean, that's a pretty yeah, uh, that's heavy, well. heavy machine gun, I met us luck. Right? Yeah, that's, that was <laughs> our investment. Uh, we invested in, in GPUs. That's that's what we do at Dusk. We we buy GPUs because we, <laughs> we like them. What are more or less the dimensions of the model you use? Uh, I mean, it really depends if we are in the encoder or in some feature extraction layer or in the decoder or in the vocoders. Uh, um, I mean, we are using embedding of the text embeddings are 512 dimensionals. The style embeddings vary from 32 to 256, it depends. Um, internal latent representation around, I think, 1024. But it really depends from experiment to experiment and what we want to alight in that experiment. So as, as a general rule, the conditioning uh, the conditioning uh, embeddings are 32 dimensions. Okay, there was another uh, question on top, I was told. Um, ah, are you a startup innovativa? Did you go through an no, 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 there, is a, there is a question from uh, Anna. Uh, why does it have to be in the particular text or spelling in English? Uh, it's, uh, it's up. Uh, why does it have to be in that particular text or spelling in English? What's the difference ah. having the correct okay. spelling? Ah, in the Italian model. Okay, the sorry. Because, because the actual, um, let's say that you, you are creating a kind of language model when you are doing these, these embeddings from, from text. And the pronunciation it learns from this language model is an Italian one. So if it says, C and H in Italian is pronounced K, but C and H in English could be pronounced CH, for example, like cherry. And if you, if I write cherry, it, it will read carry. So I need to uh, write the Italian English text in order to make it work in English. And but of course, if, it's if, I, if I put the, the correct spelling, uh, I am Lorenzo, it will be I am Lorenzo, just to give you an idea. Um, another question from Martina, great presentation. Do you use those tensor techniques for dealing with your data? Tensor techniques meaning if our internal representation of the of the data is tensors, uh, I would say yes, of course. Um, we are all PyTorch based, so we, we work with, with, with tensors all the time. I, I hope I understood the question. I don't know if I'm answering to, to the right question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Fede, which question? Ah, super cool. Did you already implement a sentence? No, it's the first one I answered. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think uh, all the questions are answered, maybe. Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think if there are no questions anymore, we can stop here. I like uh, the, the comment from, uh, sorry again if I pronounce uh, not correctly, Pragati Gupta is said like, although I don't understand Italian, but surely I could infer the emotions. I mean, this is a nice, yeah, this is nice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting 
interesting presentation and very i mean i think i think everyone had fun in this listening to it yeah I, I yes, think so was, easy. yeah i think that what i wanted to say is that it's having such talk and meeting such such people is very very inspiring uh, especially for the first question that's why why i want i wanted to ask you ask to to christian is why why they came back to italy to start this the, the startup it's because maybe we need some example of success and that you can build very interesting and very entertaining and fun uh, but also impactful thing and also during this presentation i read the comment that said, that said if there were more people like them in italy it would be a better place i think that i wanted to to show also uh, is that there wow. is already people like that uh, wow. just we need a way to express it and to make it possible and so showing the potential of Daskel and voice and what christian and lorenzo and the other guys did it was very inspiring and i, I hope it would like that also for you thank you very much marco. Thank, thank you. you very much i mean thank you for thank you marco whoever wrote that uh, sentence because uh, it means uh means really a lot okay thank you okay so, so and, uh, th thank for, you. Uh, for uh, uh, any further uh, um, like a discussion i mean don't worry uh, you can contact us uh, on linkedin or privately and uh, we are happy to hear from you also for uh, next opportunities uh, for you or we have a lot of copies to offer in our in our office <laughs> <laughs> that's important okay okay thank so again, guys and thank you all the participants who make uh, questions of course okay we can stop here Thanks. okay goodbye guys yes goodbye bye bye, bye. thanks